So we are going to discuss particularly important because this is how we call these pilot actions that were carried out within the project. And this is TAIS, which stands for Tailored Attention and Inclusion Strategies. Uh, why does it have this name? The idea is to tailor something to be innovative and to be personalized, designed to respond to the specific needs of one of the vulnerable groups identified in the given country based on the qualitative research, based on the interviews. Um, and together with the stakeholders and together with members of the action research units, uh, all kinds of professionals, NGO representatives and others who are active in the field, the national teams of TAIS implementation started to design and implement uh, pilot activities in all countries. Uh, these national teams included on one hand the consortium member partners, uh, and on the other hand, the stakeholders, organizations, specialists, activists, civil society in each country. The tentative time frame of this pilot action was set in three rounds of implementation. Round one uh, started in April 2020 and lasted until November of that year. The second round started in November 2020 and went until April 2021. And the last round started in April 2021 and lasted until November last year. As you see from the timeline, exactly when the whole story should have started, the first wave of coronavirus uh, hit in. So we will come back to this later because uh, that was quite a headache for, for many of us because all the activities that we uh, wanted to start to implement had to be redesigned. Um, the aims, the challenges, and the solutions of this uh, one and a half year of intense piloting was based on a couple of uh, conceptual ideas that we had in the beginning already. Ties were conceptualized having in mind this social and political ecosystem in which a pilot project can take shape. Uh, and we distinguished, as it was mentioned already in previous presentations, different levels of intervention for possible pilot actions. The macro level, the level of policy, the level of governance, the level, level of law. The meso level, which is the level of NGOs, organizations, institutions, uh, uh, actors of society, and the micro level, the individual, and the interpersonal level. It was quite obvious that within a research project, in the time frame of two and a half years, three years, we cannot change the macro level of refugee integration. So we cannot change laws in a country. We cannot change institutions in a country. However, we can change things on the meso and on the micro level. So we can make a change in the institutional framework within NGOs, within service provider uh, networks, and we can also provide novel services to beneficiaries uh, uh, on the micro level. Each ties was tailored in a way that it should have fit the local environment and address the given vulnerability context of which we heard uh, in a previous panel. So these activities were quite diverse. There was no universal recipe for these ties. Each national team had the liberty to choose the right way of tailoring their actions. And then, as, as I have just mentioned, the COVID pandemic broke out precisely when the first wave of implementation should have started. So there was a complete redesign of many activities, and we will discuss it briefly in this panel as well. Many of the activities could be continued and carried out online, but many could not. So uh, that was quite a big difficulty. I will briefly present uh, the experiences from these countries but you have this handy leaflet in your conference package, so I invite everybody to have a look at this because it contains the short description of the Thais in each country. So what I'm just going to present in a couple of sentences, you will have access to a, uh, to a description in this leaflet and also uh, on our website. So what was done in each of the partner countries? In Finland, the TAIS was designed in the form of two parallel activities. 
One was a multilingual online forum uh, for young asylum-seeking men who live in reception centers and who have few social connections uh, with Finnish society. So the idea was to set up um, an online forum in which they can start to uh, start conversations, they, they can start uh, uh, getting to know uh, people from Finland. And the other um, activity was to develop childcare services at the reception centers for families with small children. In Hungary, the objective of the Thais was to uh, do a quote-unquote trajectory monitoring toolbox for social workers. So the main objective was to enable social workers who work with uh, vulnerable refugees to do their work in a more differentiated way, uh, to recognize and to assess the con context of vulnerability of the people they are working with. In the case of Italy, uh, the piloting uh, had the name of All You Can Learn, and I saw this beautiful uh, publication here, uh, issued by Cessie. So this pilot involved forcibly displaced women living uh, or exposed to highly vulnerable situations and conditions, victims of human trafficking, uh, etc., currently living in Sicily, uh, originally from African countries. In the case of Jordan, the Thais aimed to provide psychological support for refugees together with online trainings about uh, financial, legal and health awareness. In the case of Lebanon, the Thais promoted health awareness among Syrian refugees living in camps. Because of the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, it was necessary to combine these awareness raising activities with a more strategic approach to trainings focusing on social and emotional well-being of people living uh, in camps during the pandemic. The Thais in Spain consisted of a training and counseling program for self-employment for sub-Saharan women seeking international protection whose application has been accepted, rejected, or was pending at the time uh, of implementation. And last but not least, the team in Turkey designed the Thais to focus on the monitoring of social integration of vulnerable FDPs, forcibly displaced people, through a series of workshops to enhance the capacities and awareness for various stakeholders. So these are like just a couple of quick ideas so you become a bit more familiar with uh, the heterogeneity of the topics that we have been working with. But you can read more about uh, the Thais experience in these leaflets and on the website. And we are going to discuss three cross-cutting issues in this panel that was quite uh, important for us during the Thais planning and implementation. One was the idea of tailoring, so based on a general idea of how to provide services or how to make any kind of uh, uh, activities that is actually good for the beneficiaries or good for the people working with uh, forcibly displaced people, how to make it more tailored, how to make it uh, in a way that it would fit the local context. The second one is the level of intervention. I was mentioning it that we excluded the possibility to change everything in a given country, like the general government attitude or the legal uh, background of our activities. But then we had to decide between a more micro, more interpersonal, uh, direct um, approach to, to beneficiaries or a more meso-level approach that uh, focuses on NGOs, on networks of institutions, so that kind of institutional um, field. So what was behind the choice and what, was, uh, what were the lessons learned? And last but not least, we will be discussing uh, the effect of the coronavirus. And we will be uh, discussing these topics in a way that uh, we we, we are going to be a bit more uh, focused, so not all partners will have the same amount of time to give answers to the questions. So the, for the first question, I will invite uh, the representatives of the teams from Spain, Italy, and Jordan to give a detailed answer, and the other three uh, country representatives to only uh, comment shortly. And for the second question, we will switch, so the other three um, country representatives will have uh, time for detailed answer and then the other three for a short answer and then just a quick round of questions uh, about COVID. So let's start with our host, Luisa, representing Cessia Italy. And I would like to ask you to briefly present 
how did you have the idea of doing exactly what you did, so how that kind of tailoring of the activity was going on in your case uh, at CSIE? Again, Brava, perfect. So sorry for the short <laughs> interruption. So I was saying that uh, I'm Luisa Dizzon and I have the pleasure to represent Cecilia, the uh, Italian partner. And um, following up with the conversations uh, of this morning where we analyze the vulnerabilities of our co-experts, as we like to call them, in the RISE project, so not of our target groups. It's not uh, that the refugees and uh, vulnerable people we have been working with are only our target group or our beneficiaries, but we really wanted them to be and we, we were co-working with them as co-experts because we wanted to learn from them what they would actually need uh, in terms of uh, training or services that would support their inclusion process. So uh, Cecilia has been a long-lasting experience in working with uh, migrants in general and in, with forcibly displaced people. Uh, we were analyzing also uh, our own tradition of doing uh, education and training. Uh, so we wanted to look at some facts uh, in Palermo, in Sicily, but also all over uh, Italy uh, by looking at statistics that are numbers, but we want to see the faces behind. We noticed that there is a high number of uh, need among forcibly displaced people, which means they are not in education, uh, employment or training, and that there is a very low female representation in education and training, as we heard also this morning from Naima's contribution in Jordan. And we notice a very high level of dropout. So considering that Cesia is a training provider, uh, we were analyzing which are the elements that make them, which make educational pathways uh, too strict to be um, beneficial for forcibly displaced people. So very often the timing of training opportunities are very strict and the way we provide and we deliver training are uh, often very ethnocentric and we just uh, start from our assumptions as the Europeans providing training for forcibly displaced people. So the RISED experience was really important for us as an organization, as training provider, mm -hmm. to think uh, what can we do different this time? We heard that responsible research and innovation was embedded in all our analysis and in our action plans. So we were thinking, how, what can we do differently in order to increase uh, participation of uh, forcibly displaced people in education? What would make them more satisfied of their own learning path? And um, how can we decrease this initial resistance of, in starting even a course? And uh, what can we uh, pass them in terms of knowledge in order for them to start uh, self-employment or getting employed? Um, as, as a matter of fact, uh, many come to, to Palermo or to Italy or to Europe hoping in a better life, but there is a need for direct income in order to send also back to the families that they left. So we notice that too often we decide what you have to learn and expect that what we think that you might need in terms of learning outcomes is what will make it for your future. So we turned uh, the game upside down and instead of uh, proposing a training path that is induced, we think you should learn that. We, we wanted to make this uh, change 
in management, in providing education, so from an edu induced approach to a selective one. So the name of our strategy, innovative strategy, was all you can learn, starting from a concept of a buffet, no? all you can eat, so all you can learn. And um, the idea was to enhance and increase uh, the level of autonomy and, um, uh, and decision-making capacity of each individual trainee. So we would uh, take the time to uh, introduce uh, learning objectives uh, starting from citizenship in Italy or even education in terms of uh, family planning, so also sexuality, uh, be it how to write your own CV. So it was, we offered uh, a panorama of uh, lots of different items, but we wanted them to decide what do you actually need. Com uh, considering um, their interests in learning, their migration plan, if they were even considering to stay in Italy. As we heard this morning, not because you are a person of color, it's meant that you are not educated. So in order to provide a training that uh, fits to each individual person, we created this um, online menu, let's say, uh, where each trainee could pick exactly the learning menu that would satisfy their um, hunger of learning and for integration. So this is in maybe in brief the big and complex um, strategy uh, we implemented and um, thank you. Thank you so much, Luisa. And the final product, this all-you-can-learn brochure, can be found outside. Yeah, it's actually just uh, the trainee's diary. It's a support for each individual mm -hmm. learner. But uh, it's just, it's the innovation to us was really the concept from I choose for you, now you choose for yourself. And then we would find a way on how to deliver it in a group because it was never an individual uh, session for learning. It's then up to, the, to our trainers to have enough experience to adapt each session by introducing the subjects each one was choosing. So it's not about one-to-one -one learning. Group learning is definitely very much important. But we will tackle those subjects that the people in that specific room that they want to listen to. And second, let's discuss the ties implemented in Jordan. So I invite Amani and Kafaya to have a quick presentation about your tailoring okay. process. Okay. Thank you. Um, we are a team from Jordan. My name is Amani. I'm the one who was corresponding to design and implement the ties by YU team. And my colleagues, one of the ARO members, Kifaya, Ms. Kifaya, um, he was one of the responsible persons who make a training and preparing the training material with other t our ties. In Jordan, actually, we build the psychological refugee support forum. We get this idea during our uh, meetings and uh, workshops we had conducted with different kind of ARO's and uh, representatives from NGOs. Uh, refugees and from different uh, parts of the hexadecimals which we saw before. Um, our design process started early, we can say in August 2019. At that time we did 30 interviews with the refugees from the forced displaced persons. We chose these refugees correctly, like according to some criteria we put it before. We have an interviews by phone in the beginning with them, and if they are like the ones we looking at, we choose them and do the interviews with them. At that time, we make these interviews and make uh, having answering some questions and taking notes from them. Actually, the ones who did these interviews was the YU team. This gives us the opportunity to look more deeply about the things that these refugees sub suffer from or the needs they needed. Uh, after that, uh, we did an, um, 
study or reports about the previous studies, especially in the good and bad practices in Jordan done. Uh, this study it takes from us around two months to do it. We got an idea about how um, services provided for uh, two refugees in Jordan, what kind of uh, practices that can make the services being good and what make it being, we can say, we can say bad, but we can say like it's less level and uh, what kind of things you can achieve from it. Uh, after that, we had a big workshop. It, um, we invited in that workshop different peoples, especially from uh, international NGOs, local NGOs, from the government, from uh, researchers who are interested in refugees. We just make this workshop to listen to them, not to talk with them exactly. In the beginning, we explained the ties, aims, what do you mean by, by RR? I, what do you mean by Thai, what we aim to achieve during our work, and we then give them the chance to talk freely about their experience in the field and how they deal with refugees, what they get from that. Uh, I remember the time we already also, it was like one day workshop, we make groups, like a focus group from these participants who uh, discuss different topics. So um, um, during that time, it was open for any topic to be under uh, like uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, at the same moment, we make in a focus group with the refugee themselves to listen to them and see what kind of challenge do they face. Uh, they say, sorry, they got in their life uh, what they need during the life. And uh, according to what we had, as a final result, with discussion with some arrows, we got finally that the psychological support is one of the highlighted topics and one of the most needed things in Jordan. Uh, one of my opinion, according to the interviews which I made at that time, um, a, 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 exactly we can say like about the Syrian refugees, um, refugees from Syria start coming to Jordan in 2011 and after that. And we did the interviews in 2017. So in six years, uh, during that time, the beginning of refugees who has the, like a hope or wish they will be back to their country, the war will be ended. And at that time already they got financial assistance from different international NGOs. But in 2017, uh, the fund shorted, so no more fund for refugees. Uh, their aims and their hopes to return back is just uh, paying a stock and they don't know what's the future of Syria which make them to be really in psychological problems and they don't want to integrate with the community and with, they don't collaborate with any others. And we feel at that time we had many, many interviews with the people who had uh, problems. They don't, these problems, like psychological problems, don't allow them to talk with others, not just with, uh, like outside, even with their families member. And we, we feel that really we need such a kind of solving for these problems. Actually, with our meetings with ARO, we found that there's many gaps in some, this kind of services when they provide it. One of these gaps, they don't have like uh, comprehensive materials or something like for all. You feel uh, if you have many workshops to support them in a psychological way, uh, it's absolutely like it's not accumulative to go with a refugee from one point to be out of this problem. Uh, many of these workshops depends on the fund and usually the fund coming to support a small, a small group of people, not the whole number of the people at that time. Even the people who provide these services are not trained in enough way to deal with such a vulnerable people and to give them the chance to be out of this, uh, we can say like a closed circle. Uh, according to all these things, uh, Jordan decided to build a form that has a uh, training material, training manual at the same time. Uh, we finally built a program that supports five topics. These topics including social supports, financial health awareness, legal awareness, and um, in our topics, we build, uh, we can say like a content in methodological way. We work together with arrows and with the researchers. 
uh, two workshops is conducted like generally with our arrows, but after that, I remember after we got the first lockdown in 2020, it was in May, we get the first arrow meeting, but at that time, the, all the arrows in the meeting who are specialists in topics related to psychological support. We choose carefully the people to work with us. I did a course with these arrows and I spent many hours just to um, like tell them about our work and what the objectives and what kind of benefit they can get from that. And I'm proud that most of uh, people we talk with them, they agree to work with us as a volunteers and they keep working for two years for nothing. They prepare materials, they work with us as a team, uh, they um, do the workshops by themselves and they support us in our sustainability plan to uh, keep working in, in the material and the manuals we prefer. We prepared it during our um, working ties. Um, actually, um, we can say like we can say like we have no, some kind of combination of our work between scientific methods and uh, practical things in the uh, field because we had a specialist as a PhD holders in psychological supports and we have some uh, specialists who are working in evaluations and assessments and at the same time we have the arrows who are the volunteers working in real life time. And mostly these arrows were happy to get and uh, exchange and share their experience with us and to get some kind of benefit from our scientific methodologies which we give them many times as a uh, training, as a workshops to put them in the right way and train them to deal with such topics in uh, a way that can help refugees to get out of these problems. Uh, as a final result of uh, our work, uh, we were happy to uh, get some documents, uh, training materials, training manuals, and it's distributed right now by many NGOs and it's used now and even it's teaching by some professors at Yarmouk University. Uh, hello everybody, I know it's a short time, uh, I would like to inform you, uh, my name is Kifaya Khadr, uh, I am a freelance trainer, uh, I volunteer with the Yarmouk University, uh, many thanks for them because they give me this chance to be with you today. Uh, I will talk about uh, my experience as a trainer in TAIS during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, which was a successful opportunity to reach the most vulnerable people in remote and urban area, even the people they are in the camps. Uh, we also reached the areas that lack available services during the implementation of online workshop. Uh, we reach the largest number uh, of these needy groups, and we are proud of that as a trainer. Uh, in, in fact, we have some challenges through our training on online, uh, which is, uh, as a trainer during our uh, COVID, we lost the most important uh, implementation of the training, which is face-to-face -face communication with the trainers. And this is it's the most important, uh, which make our training effectively. Uh, I know it's a short time. I would like to have some uh, things also to add, but short time, I can't uh, yani explain all the challenges which we faced as a trainer, but really it was a good chance for us through COVID-19. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And we can come back to this topic when we discuss the effect of COVID and the lockdown. So you will have the... Okay, thank you so much, Amani and, and Kafaya. And now let's discuss what happened in Spain, Lisa. Actually, we saw some snapshots uh, of, of the Aru's work already and how, uh, what kind of beneficiaries you worked with. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Bella. 
Yes, uh, I have to say, to start with, that the arrows were crucial for the development of our, our tailored attention and inclusion strategy. Um, I think the word tailored, it is very eloquent because it describes how you tailor attention and inclusion strategies to the needs to a very specific beneficiary uh, group. And it is pretty much like the, the way a tailor makes a suit when he starts to make a suit. So I will use this simile to explain how we did the uh, uh, tailored attention strategy in Spain. I was, was about um, uh, 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 labor integration of women from sub-Saharan countries from Cameroon, Nigeria, Burundi and, uh, Burundi and Ivory Coast. And the program was called Refuge of Power. It was about powering women. Uh, first, when you start making a suit, the tailor, what does he do? do? So he asks the client for the needs. He, know, he needs to know the measures and the needs of the client. So in our case, we did uh, interviews to forcibly displaced people. Half of them were uh, women from sub-Saharan countries, so very similar in characteristic to the future beneficiaries of the program. And these interviews helped us to define their vulnerability profile, to know their context, both in the countries of origin, in the transit, and also in the receiving society. So it was easier to start that way. And we found out that the, one of the major difficulties they had was um, accessing the labor market. Of course, they also, many of them, they struggled with uh, language difficulties. And of course, as happens all over the world, the bureaucracy of getting the refugee status, the work permits, and these things are tremendously difficult. And also, they had family worries and uh, troubles, and often the families had been torn apart in the exile process. And uh, following the simile of tailoring the suit, once you know the, the needs of the client, what do you do then? Well, the tailor explores some catalogs of different kinds of suits and sees what is the pattern, what kind of solutions can we find. So the researchers in all the Reist Consortium uh, explored attention and inclusion strategies in the participating countries, around 10, 12 different strategies, and all over the world. That could give us some in inspiration when designing these tailored attention and inclusion strategies. And then, once we have the inspiration and we know the needs, so the tailor, then he makes the pattern, he cuts the fabric, then he strews it, and uh, then he, he tries it on the, on the client. How did we do that? We had workshops with um, NGOs, uh, with uh, humanitarian agencies, local administration, and even with some companies, and of course, possibly displaced people themselves. And we together decided and, uh, what was the main goal, which was, as I said before, the labor market integration by training I, and by mentoring and assisting them to start a cooperative, which was our initial objective. We trained them in linguistic, administrative, business, job, job seeking, uh, IT, etc. skills. And uh, as Bella mentioned uh, before, so when the training started or when the tie started in the different countries, the pandemic had reached the peak, so of course all the activity had gone online. So um, following the simile of the, the tailor, uh, once you have one suit made, so of course you had to try it on several times and make adjustments, and that happened. And that happened because of the COVID and other difficulties that were on the, on the road. So in uh, in, uh, in our ties or in our tailored strategy, we had three successive rounds of action and after each round of action of training, uh, we uh, evaluated the results and made adjustments to the contents. 
in the very first beginning we found that the um, uh, online training was quite demanding for the beneficiaries and they lacked uh, devices, so we provided them with laptops and gave some IT training, which was important, and also Spanish uh, language skills training. And uh, after the first and second evaluation rounds, we found that uh, setting up a cooperative, which was initially a very good idea, became more difficult due to the COVID context, because it also caused the economic crisis in Spain. So we decided to drop that uh, goal, and we decided to focus in their professional skills and uh, personal traits, and also give some tools for self-employment instead of that. And then the program finished with uh, individual mentoring. So all of the participants, they got individual mentoring very much uh, similar to the Italian training in this sense that it was very much in the individual level. And what happens uh, with a suit if it uh, really fits the client and the client likes it and the results are positive? So, of course, uh, the tailor um, makes it become part of a catalog. So, that is something that uh, we hope that will have happen with our ties. We hope that uh, the method and the pilot experience uh, will be useful for similar initiatives for other organizations in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for keeping this metaphor of tailoring throughout the whole presentation. And I think it's really important to understand that kind of responsiveness that was the key idea, that we should listen to what uh, beneficiaries actually need before offering solutions to, to problems that we still don't know. I invite the other three uh, country representatives to give some remarks or comments in one, two minutes each, beginning with Marta from Finland. Yeah, so. So in Finland, uh, we decided to tailor attention and inclusion strategies for two subgroups of asylum seekers whose needs seem to be under-recognized uh, in the Finnish context and, and in the Finnish reception services. So, so we had uh, two ties, uh, pilots, and, and we did this decision based on interviews that we did with uh, both asylum seekers themselves and also reception center professionals. So, uh, the first pilot was a multilingual online uh, discussion group, uh, a forum, and it was uh, tailored to fit needs of young asylum seeking men uh, who are often placed in reception centers that are situated in remote areas of Finland and they often have quite little possibilities to, uh, to meet uh, peers like uh, other Finnish speaking men. So, so in, in this pilot, we invited uh, both voluntary asylum-seeking men and also Finnish-speaking men to, uh, to, to an online platform to discuss and, and to learn from, from each other. And, and we had uh, three cycles or uh, three, three rounds of these discussions and, and after each round, uh, this f forum or platform was, was uh, developed based on the feedback that the participants gave. And then uh, uh, we had another pilot, and it was targeted to meet a specific needs of, of uh, asylum-seeking families who have small children and, and who are living in reception centers and in the context uh, of in which they have no access to, to regional daycare in Finland. So, so asylum-seekers are, are not not uh, included, they are not provided this, this uh, mainstream service. So, so we decided to, uh, to develop uh, childcare services in, in reception centers uh, and with, with centers who are already providing these, these services. So uh, we, were, we were identifying good practices, what they already have, we, we are identifying uh, some targets of development and, and, uh, and, and while one of the, the main problem was, was uh, the small amount of childcare they were provided, we also had a, a trial of more frequent childcare. So for 
uh, period of nine weeks, there was more childcare available, and, and these families were also provided transportation to, to ease uh, the use of, of these services. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Marta. I invite the Turkish team, Deniz and Duygu, to give some remarks about your tailoring process. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Bella. We built our tailored attention inclusion strategy by our, our meetings. In these meetings with our, our members who are the representative of uh, local municipality, NGOs, and the forcibly displaced people. After the meetings, we concluded that the main problem in the local manner is that service providers and forcibly displaced people don't have uh, don't the communication that they uh, that they are supposed to have. So, for simple displays, people have many problems to get service and to reach the daily life uh, needs like uh, health. So, we basically, in three steps, establish our ties. Uh, the first step was the survey. Uh, we conduct a survey to service provided about intercultural communication uh, competence and their intercultural uh, uh, sensitivity. The results of the survey, they have abs absolute awareness and respect for the another culture. They aware of diversity, they aware of cultural diversity, and due to the results, they know what they are dealing with and they know how to communicate with forcibly displaced people and other people from the other cultures than themselves. So, in the second steps, we try to uh, look at if it's really okay, uh, because the survey results show that uh, the statistically values are very high, uh, and we have some doubts about uh, their uh, decision about intercultural uh, sensitivity and competence. And so we manage a pre-training uh, uh, about diversity and cultural diversity. And as a result of these trainings, it was the opposite of the survey. Because we have some feedback about uh, their information. Uh, and we uh, uh, figure out uh, some prejudice and communication barriers. So we saw that service providers who work with the first displaced people need to be trained about monitoring, also uh, includes capacity building, uh, diversity management, and the inclusive uh, practices. So that's how our tailored attention and inclusion strategy just built up. Uh, in the third uh, step, we did our main TICE trainings, the service providers, we are training about diversity, cultural diversity, uh, cultural, uh, intercultural sensitivity, uh, and monitoring by the experts uh, who have been working with refugees uh, and forcibly displaced people and women about mostly experts in gender, refugee studies, and international culture studies. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. And last but not least, I'm asking my colleague Bernadette to say a couple of words about what happened in the Hungarian case. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, during the, the panel in the morning, uh, it has been already mentioned that uh, vulnerability contexts can have reoccurring patterns, which are also interrelated, and therefore one must approach it from the individual's point of view when interpreting a particular vulnerability. So for example, living alone or having a family. So our interviewees agree that a protective role of a family uh, is important. Its lack makes them more vulnerable. However, we also talk to people who became more vulnerable because of the, their family situation and, and status. So based on, on the results of mapping the vulnerability context, we concluded, in, especially in Hungary, that service providers play a pivotal role in um, vulnerability reduction. So we emphasized our pilot program to service providers. Thank you.
Thank you so much for all the contributions. And it's really important to see here that all these tailoring processes led us to, to difficult choices. And this is what the second round of questions will be about, because if you have limited time and if you have limited resources and you identify complex problem, like complex sets of changing diverse vulnerabilities, it's really important to understand who you are going to implement the pilot to. So whether you're providing services to concrete individuals, it runs the risk that you're going to do a training for, let's say, 15 people, and then the project is over and the story is ending with them. Or if you're doing some kind of, of training or, or activity to people who actually work with vulnerable people, so after the end of the project, they can go on and, and doing their work uh, perhaps better than they used to. Uh, but this way, it's really important to ensure that actually uh, the, like, the effects will reach uh, the end uh, beneficiary groups. So we had these dilemmas of targeting, whether to, to go to the micro level, the interpersonal level, or whether to target the service provider level, the meso level of institutions. And we will discuss it uh, in a way that starting from the Finnish case, because you had, it a quite you, you had a quite complex uh, solution to that. So how did you decide between the micro level and the meso level and why? Yeah, so, so both of these, these pilots, this multilingual online forum and, and development of childcare services uh, provided direct support for asylum seekers li living in Finland. Uh, so, so the level of intervention was, was mainly uh, micro level. But, but also we had in, in, in both uh, pilots, like they had some, some implications uh, uh, on the institutional level. So we had a combination of, of of both levels and in, in two ties. And I'll, I'll open up this a bit, bit more. So, uh, so the focus of, of online forum was, was primarily on individual level of, of asylum seekers the, uh, and the Finnish voluntary men who, who were participating on the discussions and, and, uh, and on promotion of, of their uh, capacities. So, so uh, one, one aim was that, that these asylum seeking men uh, are, are able to improve their written uh, English skills in the discussion forum and, and that they would also uh, get some practical information about, about Finnish society and, and institutions. And, and uh, on the other hand, uh, these uh, Finnish speaking men were able to to uh, get some first-hand knowledge about what it is to be an asylum seeker in Finland and what kind of backgrounds these people have and, and what kind of position in, in the society and, and, and the, what kind of problems they may face in their everyday lives. So uh, in that addition to, to promoting the knowledge and, and skills, uh, of these people, we also had, or the pilot also aimed to, to increase trust uh, between these, these uh, two, two groups of, of men by providing a, a platform where they could uh, uh, discuss and, and learn from each other in a, in a uh, positive and, and, uh, and uh, uh, trustful environment. And uh, this, uh, this, we also had, a, oh, this pilot has a stress on the MESA level on, also in a way that, that uh, uh, Finnish Red Cross and, and reception uh, system or reception centers were uh, involved as, as uh, institutions. So one aim was to, to, uh, to encourage them to, to, to benefit from uh, maybe a bit new new ways of understanding, like how could uh, could uh, voluntary work be be done with, with uh, asylum seekers, and and how, how online tools could be used. And then um, this second ties uh, developing childcare services in reception centers uh, aim to promote well-being of 
of uh, families who have small children that are seeking asylum in Finland. So, so here also uh, the, uh, it affected mainly on, on individual and, and family levels. So, so uh, the idea was that uh, that that uh, these childcare services enable parents to to uh, have a child-free moments few times a week, so they could, uh, for example, study or or, or rest, and uh, and of course, like for children participating in in this kind of structured uh, activities is is a. Uh, a, a way to, to foster their well-being and, and also learning while they are not, not able to, uh, to participate in, in, in the municipal daycare. And uh, here also, also in addition to this micro-level impasses, uh, this, this uh, pilot served some, some meso-level functions. Uh, this uh, developing work was, was conducted in very close cooperation with, with reception center professionals. So, so it was also an intervention to these professional uh, practices. And, and based on these experiences of this pilot and, and knowledge uh, that, that we have from here, we are now also writing a, a model for uh, childcare services to, to be used in all reception centers in Finland. So, so uh, the emphasis was on micro level, but still we wanted also to, to contribute uh, or give some perspe uh, perspectives in, in the institutional level. So this kind of mixture. Thank you so much, Martin. Yes, indeed, it was quite a complex thais, a set of two thais. And, and it was really going from the, from the individual level to some kind of more systematic mm -hmm. uh, um, wishes for change. Thank you for, uh, for the presentation. And I'm asking the Turkish team to um, explain a bit your approach, your choice. Uh, do you go, right? Okay. Yes, do you go. Thank you. Okay, I think. So, um, we work with meso levels in our Thais. And we came to this conclusion just before Dennis explained with our, our meetings in our action, uh, action research unit. We have forcibly displaced people themselves, the local government and NGOs representatives. And in our other meetings, we came to conclusion that refugees and mostly forcibly displaced women and girls cannot communicate very well functioned with the social workers in governmental level, local governmental level. So we, this emerged the idea that we have to uh, raise the awareness of the social workers, how to deal with the diversity, cultural diversity, gender-based is issues. So that's why we chose mainly meso-level, but also kind of a micro-level as well too. And um, also the other important thing, maybe in Turkey, in that we can uh, say the host community is also vulnerable in Turkey because of the uh, gender-based issues, domestic violence issues, because of the patriarchal problems in our country, and also with the economic and the political situations during these last years. So it was very important for us to raise the awareness of the social workers who were mostly women and had no idea about gender-based problems, domestic violence, and had no idea how to deal with them. So it was more complex when you challenge with gender-based domestic violence and at the same time with the forcibly displaced people, refugees, women and children, and girls mostly. So that's why we chose to work with the institutional and social worker uh, levels in our choice. I can say that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Duygu, and I think it's quite similar in approach to the Hungarian one. So, Bernadette, please present what uh, the Hungarian team uh, has chosen to do. Thank you, Bela. Uh, yes, so I will start with a little background of the Hungarian context. So, as the aftermath of the big influx of refugees in 2015, the Hungarian government created a, a hostile political environment uh, due to which the, the service providing structures have been and are still in a, in a very difficult situation. 
um, and the difficult access to, to institutions and the service um, and the services, this whole thing has a negative effect on the vulnerability of forcibly displaced people. Uh, and therefore, the Hungarian pilot pro program took place on, on the meso level because we were not able to achieve any changes at the, at the macro level. And also potentially affected the, the micro, the individual level on, on the long term. So as I already said, the emphasis was on the social workers and the helpers of other NGOs and volunteers. Um, so we, uh, we did some reviewing of, of cases, uh, reflecting on them with the social workers, and this brought uh, a professional deepening. And it was also crucial to consider the emotional burden uh, on the social workers when dealing with clients in, in a difficult situation. So my colleague already said in the morning that in, in Hungary, it's, uh, it's very complicated. Uh, the, the asylum system. So the, the state-run programs are not visible anymore. Um, housing programs, language courses, labor market integration programs, which were supported by the Asylum Migration and Integration Fund, uh, has or are not available since 2018. Um, so that was quite a, a harsh uh, reaction of, of the government, but now in this new Ukrainian crisis, uh, things have shifted a little bit in the communication of the government. Uh, so now they are they are supporting or trying to help those who those who flee from from the country, but also um, the the closeness of of the war uh, has changed the perception of of the Hungarians about refugees. So now we can use the word refugee again. Um, and, uh, and yes, people has, uh, has shown uh, a great solidarity towards, towards those who, who now come to, to Hungary. Um, and we, as an NGO, and we also have social workers, they, they try to help as much as they can in this very complicated situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and it shows the importance of, 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 of this shifting vulnerability context once again that we have been discussing uh, a couple of times. So I would like to invite Luisa and then uh, uh, our colleagues from Jordan and then uh, Lisa to say some quick comments to what has already been discussed so far in one, two minutes maximum per person. About your Thais, so why did you opt to, do, to focus on where you focused? Yes, thank you. Um, actually, the socio-ecological model and the micro, miso and macro was for us really also an innovation in understanding. Uh, so this breaking down into blocks almost, of understanding for us as a training center was very much important and I guess it is, will be a lesson learned that we will put in our um, backpack for future uh, projects of this kind. But uh, during the implementation, the district uh, differentiation of micro and meso was lost. I mean, the benefit was of putting them under the same umbrella. So, of course, we were working with the ladies, so it was at micro level, but we as a training center are already on the MISO level. But the very, I mean, the ambitious part was thanks to learning at the micro level what they need, and we learning what we should we provide them, we hoped in uh, an impact also at macro level. So if this model of education, of selective education, uh, is beneficial for the forcibly displaced people, it optimizes also the work for training providers. This 
in our ambition, it was uh, also a way to uh, suggest to stakeholders and policy makers to adopt this kind of selective approach, to invest in more pilotings to see the actual uh, final benefit. Regrettably, COVID arrived for all of us, so um, the limit of our research was indeed not uh, having been able to follow through to see how, if the experimental group, which we actually did with the guys, um, was more into education and would finalize and finish uh, the training program compared to the, let's say, the control group, the traditional way of delivering education as we have done in these 20 years of, of Chesia. So, um, meso, micro, together to improve the macro system. At least this was the, the ambitious hope. Thank you so much. There is no easy answer to this question, mm. whether you, you target the micro level or meso, because at the end of the day, you have to have a holistic view on, on the changes. How was it in Jordan? How did you set uh, the, the levels in which you wanted to have a change? Um, okay, so for Jordan, it was really, um, we can say, like big or huge work about the ties, and we support five topics during our uh, psychological farm, so we can say like it's some kind of combination between micro and meso levels in both, because when you're giving a support for personals as a personality, that means you uh, enhance them to integrate and uh, uh, deal with the city around him, especially in economic and health cares and these topics. Um, our providing for um, uh, refugees is not like directly exactly, it was by the professionals. We build the training programs uh, according to content and the practical methods they can deal with refugees during it, uh, using it. And we believe that could reach more refugees using this technique. You don't stop just with the ones you do evaluation with them. No, you can share your practice methods with others. And this um, methods and content could be transferred from one generation to another. And it could be like uh, having a sustainability during your work. Thank you very much. And last but not least, how was it in Spain? How did you set the focus? Well, in Spain, the process was very similar to the one in Italy, as uh, Luisa explained. So we mainly targeted at micro level because the, it was a direct service offered to forcibly displaced people, in this case, the women uh, from sub-Saharan regions. But indirectly, no doubt, it benefited also the participating NGOs, local administration, and uh, researchers. We, we decided to focus on this target group uh, uh, because the need was detected in the initial interviews. So, um, and also in the first workshops where we gathered together the NGOs and administration, so this was very much emphasized there, so therefore we went for this um, tailored attention and inclusion strategy. And also I have to admit that as a university partner, so everything that is training or mentoring is uh, like within our expertise. So. Um, it was natural that we would go for that kind of services rather than other kind of social integration system. And uh, I think uh, we might have had some uh, mesolevel uh, effects because the participating organizations, some NGOs uh, have spoken and told like Noelia said the other day that uh, they are really interested in the working methodology and uh, in replicating experiences like our ties, so we really hope it is useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And things are starting to, to take shape because I think that the audience already understands how difficult it was to find like really tailored ways in which uh, these pilots were responsive to the actual needs. At the same time, uh, the focus was well set, so, so which uh, are the objectives that we should have um, 
reaching in one and a half year. So it was a difficult exercise from the beginning, and then we had this extra difficulty of COVID. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you one by one to speak about how you managed to overcome, because it was more or less the same dilemma for everybody, whether going online or not going online. Uh, because, you know, the easy middle class answer in, in Europe is that, okay, we do, we do everything in Zoom. But there are some things that you cannot do on Zoom, and our colleagues from Jordan already started to, to, to uh, describe that. What kind of trainings can you do on Zoom and what uh, kind of, of activities you cannot do online? So I'm not going to ask everybody to have their say, only those who request it. And I already see Amani that, that you have. Uh, me to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the challenge and opportunities created from this uh, crisis. Uh, we can say like uh, the project as other business and other works, it's uh, having a good chance to give an opportunity to do your work in a more successful way and at the same time you get some challenge and limitations during your work, but which I believe in Jordan we get the chance to go over these limitations. It was hard and we work uh, hardly at the time, but finally we go over that limitations. Uh, we believe uh, COVID gave us the chance to reach more people, especially the ones who are far away, the refugees who are in camp, and they, they didn't uh, or they don't have the uh, permission to go out that camps. So we reached them. Uh, actually, in normal life, you can't force the people to deal with telecommunications technologies and working with internet, but COVID-19 maybe forced the people and uh, allow them to do that very quickly, we can say, and this gave us the opportunity to reach such these refugees. At the same time, we still have the problem of face-to-face, -face, as usual, when you're having a training and workshops, or you're missing something could be uh, better when you have face-to-face, -face, but as a result, which we reach, we will really, you feel that you are proud of that result and you feel that you are successful of getting such point. Um, for challenge and limitations with arrows and design, it was really uh, something um, we're going around also by doing our meetings online, and we try most of time when there's like uh, no lockdown, just go hurry up, we have to do a meeting face to face because we believe that face to face usually give you more benefits. Um, but finally, we uh, did everything. Um, I'm not going to talk about the financial things and problems got it from COVID because I think all the partners, they had the same problem. But um, um, my focus right now that we got or we reach more people and that uh, give us the chance to uh, believe that we are success about the sustainability and the online platforms that could help refugees. Um, this is all. and. I want to leave some time to others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amani. Who else wants to add comments or remarks on the COVID mitigation topic? Yeah, okay, so the question is how could you mitigate the COVID effect? And we already have this easy answer that we go on Zoom, we go online, uh, we send out everything in this email. This was plan B. But, but yes, but what, what <laughs> goes beyond that quick, quick and easy solution? Yes. Uh, yes, definitely. We went through plan B and C and D. Um, so the initial idea, plan A, was we do it in presence. We need to feel and touch the people. We need to be able to listen to each other. Uh, but then COVID arrived, so we tried, let's do videotaping uh, our training sessions. But already at the first two attempts, there was the digital skills were not enough to allow a proper understanding of already difficult concepts. Um, so the challenge and the opportunity we had as, as a team at Chisia was to 
uh, we do the upside down again. So initially the idea was that the, our co-experts, our trainees, would come to Chesi at our offices, at our premises. For them it would have been already um, uh, an opportunity for autonomy by moving in the urban uh, structure of the city. So the the new version, the COVID version of All You Can Learn was, it was the trainers, it was Soad, it was Giovanni going into a welcome center, uh, a specific center uh, that was, is welcoming uh, women victims of uh, human trafficking and domestic violence. So um, instead of them coming to us, it was us going to them. So there were less uh, restrictions in social interaction, as it were the two, three trainers moving into the, the migrant center instead of 20 people moving at our premises. So it was an opportunity, it was a challenge, because really, how do we do it? What's plan B and what's plan C? And if this doesn't work, how can we continue otherwise? But um, as professionals in education, I guess it was very interesting also for us to make the special effort uh, to reach uh, the people. And COVID gave us, let's say, another opportunity more related to the professionals in education. We created um, a database, let's say, of resources, which then we called All You Can Teach, uh, where there can be found training materials and guidance uh, in understanding also the different vulnerabilities, and where the local communities and international partners are invited also to add their own learning and training material. Uh, so, as we learned uh, from several schools and other educational training centers, they said, now we have to do everything online. We do not know which kind of activities we could propose and suggest. So, starting from these needs of having new material or feasible material for that uh, modality of education delivery, we thought we have 20 years of experience. Our local and international partners have been working hardly in producing quality training material. Why not to create a place where they can feasibly all be available? So that was also then the all you can teach. Um, you are all invited to, to have a look and maybe browse it and maybe add your own educational resources for inclusion actors all over, not only Europe, but the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. More comments or interesting stories, whatever, on behalf of the panelists. Uh, if not, we still have a couple of minutes, so I'm looking at the audience, whether you have questions to uh, the concept of Thais in general or to any of the Thais. And once again, I'm inviting you to have a look at this booklet because you have the descriptions of the Thais within. So do you have any questions to any of the panelists or any uh, like cross-cutting issue that we discussed in this panel? Uh, excuse me, just to explain something. I think COVID-19 makes us thinking in a non-traditional way because the challenge you face and the limitations we had that uh, allow you to think in different absolutely what normally you are in and give you the chance to be more creative. This is in my opinion. So because you're always solving problems and you're going behind these problems and you usually having plan A, P, C and all of them, they have to work according to the situations you are in. So um, I'm not sure that COVID is just a challenge. I think it's opportunity more than a challenge in our work, especially in Jordan, because uh, it gives us a chance to think in different ways to provide these services, how to deal with people and uh, how you can reach them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments from the audience? Ruben.
Yeah, I would like to see if you can discuss something about the changes in the attitudes of the forcibly displaced people when they were involved in the process of designing and uh, assessing the kind of uh, strategies that, after all, uh, from, they were the beneficiaries of those, of those strategies. How, I mean, how they feel it about it? And how if this changed the results? Thank you. One more question? Let's collect the questions and then the panelists can address them. Hello. Uh, I have a question about um, if uh, some, because sometimes we think uh, we can change and, and we have idea of uh, the situation. And when you work with the people in this situation, you, you, your mind, your opinion changes a lot. So I, I want to know if sometimes uh, you, you give the opportunity the, the, the person who uh, want to talk, if they uh, can um, change the ideas you bring them, you know? And I want to know if was, did it happen? And yes, it's that. Thank you very much. More questions? Yes. You might not have the answer to this one, but um, how can we all work together with our research project to influence the mac at the macro level? And the second question or comment is to the to Bernadette. Um, we have see, seen like a difference in the response to the migration um, <laughs> crisis uh, with the Ukrainian war, and especially in the response from most of. Um, the European Union countries, and specifically with Hungary and Poland, um, which has been quite racist. Um, are these changing perceptions and receptions of the Ukrainian refugees, is it because it's too close, it's too white, and it's not how a refugee should, be, should look like? Thank you. Okay, we have a sufficient number of questions to discuss. So who would like to take, I think the two first questions, Ruben's questions and Ali's questions can be discussed together. So the changes of the attitudes of the people helped, but also the changes of the attitudes of the, of the helpers themselves. So how it evolved uh, during the process. Who wants to take the question? Amani. So about the, like the change during our work, we, we believe that it's two years and this long time and everything is changed around like that. But we have a three pilot, we, have, or we can say the three rounds. And in each round in Jordanian, we're dealing with refugees, we get the input from them and when we change our uh, progress, work, and the material we prepared already. So we're going by this way. So always we have around an evaluation, validation for the material by using experts, refugees, go next round, and so on. I hope I give you the answers. Thank you. Anybody else wants to take these two first questions? Giovanni? Um, I can go trying to answer Ruben's question about the attitudes of people we work, we work with. Um, uh, there is a point to add uh, from my side, as uh, Luisa said, we were working during the COVID uh, pandemic and we tried different strategies, um, many of them failed, but one at the end succeed. succeed. And uh, is the, 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 the strategy succeed also because um, uh, people were in need of, of being listened and they want to share it. And we went to a very specific reception centers for migrants, women, victim of trafficking and domestic violence. So you can easily understand the, the, uh, the um, mental issues uh, and, uh, and, and also the life that we're living plus pandemic. So the isolation was total, total. And uh, they were isolated by society, they were isolated by other human beings, they were isolated by educational routes and connection with, uh, with uh, project as well. So we went there, it was a choice, um, 
and uh, at the beginning we have to face uh, different issues that we didn't plan, trying to answer also your question. Um, uh, there were some conflict inside the team, inside of the people living in the reception centers, so we stopped everything before going to the ties, before going to pick what you want to do and how you want to learn and what you want to learn, and try to move into conflict management first to create a very good environment. This was something that we were not prepared um, in terms of uh, uh, action to do with RICE project, but we are prepared as experts. So we, we, we change attitudes and we try to move, first of all, on our solve um, conflict inside uh, the reception centers between women and also between women and staff. So, because the pandemic bring all the people in a very anxious and, 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 and sad and, uh, uh, position. Um, so, this, this, this was the attitude and then we see. We see that, uh, uh, that they start to listen to us, they start to follow us and they start to be very active. There was one lady from Nigeria uh, she has, um, her mental condition was very, very, um, um, very difficult. So they take her baby out from from her uh, um, control, uh, yes, custody, and um, and she was not able to speak to anybody because she was full of anger, full of anger with everybody, with the society, with the Austin country, with everybody. And so we start slowly, slowly to listen, to cook together, to dance together, to talk about health and how to take uh, also care of your baby health. And uh, at the end of the day, she was able to deal with her baby. She was not put away from the, from the reception center and moving to a psychological one. And so this was an amazing result in terms of you, human beings, relationship, and understand it. This, this was just one, one, one example, but there are many of people that when you create a very good environment open to listen, um, they help you in understanding and they are able to listen. And the combination is amazing. I will work on this project for one, two years more. And, I, and this is what we are trying to do also, to connect other projects, to don't leave them alone. This is just Another point for myself, maybe it's not very uh, diplomatic to say, but I will. And I do not care very much about projects. Uh, project will finish tomorrow. I don't really care. I care about sustainability. Sustainability means that the name of Rice Project tomorrow will, can be forgotten. It's totally okay. But if you go on with the activities, you go on with the relationship between human beings, you will succeed. And I'm sure 100% because after many years of experiences, I have seen this impact. And the RISE project has an amazing, amazing background of resources, people, experts that are able to do that. And I'm very curious to see the answer about your question, Madam. Yeah, thank you, Giovanni. Actually, this was referring to, to the first question that you had about how these projects can, can go and, and change the macro level. Uh, I wonder if anybody has a systemic, optimistic take on that. Because, you know, we, we just let the, the, the macro level aside at the beginning because we said, no way, we are not going to change that. But now, based on what Giovanni just started to, to, to explain, uh, Actually, there can be ways to, 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 to join forces and to start to, to, to put pressure on the macro level. Does anybody have a good answer to that? So what, what and how can be done? Nezish, please. Hello. Okay. I think I will benefit from our own case. Uh, I think two examples can be used. One of them is, I think it starts, it ends where it starts and it starts where it ends. It, it's with the arus, in my opinion. So during the evolution of our, of our, our, of our arus, we had chance to invite bar association of our city 
So, okay, maybe they are not the policy makers, but they are a big pressure group because they are the bar association, because they deal with legal issues, policy making, regulations, and other things. So, in my opinion, sometimes it's not directly how you reach to policy making to macro levels, but actually you create a group of, um, let's say, uh, pressure or uh, bridges that actually they carry your intention. So what happened is uh, after, Aru mem uh, after Bar Association members took place in our Arus, they created a monitoring group in the Bar Association for discriminatory practices against vulnerable populations, and it still continues. So what they do is now they brought their work to the city council, so it became a wider circle. So I think maybe we may not, and it's, in my opinion, it's obvious, but I mean, with the cycles and the cycle cycles, it's getting there. In other cases, it's a well-known city in Izmir, uh, city of Izmir, according to, uh, while they were hearing f uh, about our studies or work during the project, they invited us uh, what we were doing, and it was an online meeting. So what happened is, right now, even before us, with uh, experience and knowledge sharing, they established a refugee women's council within the city council. So they have power to say words, they have kind of a, let's say, subunits to implement some policy making. So it is really affecting. One last thing to put, in my opinion, in relation to our service providers and social workers as behalf of the local government, they actually honestly told us that after the Thai implementations that they thought that they knew it, but they were not aware of it. And now with their division uh, or the department leaders, they take it more seriously. I think it takes some time, but actually I think we ignited the fire for the policy making and especially for the Bar Association City Council so that actually energizes each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nazih. And the final question, Olisa, also for, still for that? Yes, I would like to try to answer to Nancy's question, because actually um, the consortium members, we are all now uh, preparing some policy recommendations. We have gathered from the different countries in ARU meetings, in um, in focus groups, in interviews, and in informal discussions with different stakeholders. And we have worked with several uh, policy makers directly because they have participated in the design of the ties. So it will be out in about a month, a month and a half, and there are recommendations, policy recommendations from all the countries, from our experience. And many of them have been inspired by the, the beneficiaries, the forcibly displaced people, the social workers, and so on. Other thing is that uh, we don't know how the European Commission decision makers and the national level policy, policy um, makers will react and if they will really read it, but we will try our best to get our word to the important people, important policy makers, so we'll try at least. Thank you so much, Lisa. And the final question concerning Hungary. I have my own answer, but first, Bernie, go, and then I will yes. make my comments. Thank you for, for the question. I wrote down four, four things that I think it, it played or why, why this whole perception has changed. One is for sure the, the closeness of, of, the, of the war and also the, the possibility that it can happen to us as well. Hopefully it never will, but there is a, a possibility. Uh, the other thing is, yes, they do, they do look like us. They are more similar to us. They are white, they are Christian. Uh, that I think also plays uh, a major role. And then I also think that in 2015, those who came or the the, Hung the, um, the the Hungarian government showed the picture of 
of young men or only men who came to Hungary and they had darker skin, they had different religion, and now we see women and children coming to, to Hungary because the men had, has to, they have to stay in, in Ukraine to, uh, uh, to, to be in the war and to save the country. And the other thing, uh, the last one, that also uh, until Trianon, I think, uh, the south region of, uh, of Ukraine was a part of Hungary. So there are a lot of uh, people with double nationalities. So they are Hungarians living in Ukraine. And also they come now to, to Hungary. So of course we have to, to help our brothers and or mainly sisters. <laughs> um, but we also see problems, uh, for instance, with the, with the Roma families. Um, they are quite discriminated now, even though they are also fleeing from the war, but we see from organizations or people who want to host um, uh, refugees that they are not really inclined to, to take Roma families into their homes. Um, and also, there is also a problem with, with, the, with the third country national students who studied in, in Ukraine. Uh, the Hungarian government uh, did not allow them to ask for protected status, so most of them had to go back to their country or probably uh, go to other countries in, in Europe. Thank you so much, and just one additional thought from my side, and I'm not downplaying the effect of racism in this case. So there is racism, there was racism in the previous refugee crisis, but there was an important difference between the two in the way how Hungary received the refugees in, in 2015 and how Hungary is receiving refugees now. Uh, in 2015, when the refugees arrived, in August 2015 to, to Hungary, when this uh, uh, massive arrival to, to central Budapest happened, it was already after months of massive government propaganda against the refugees. So what happened first was uh, people watching uh, things on TV, and then when the actual refugees arrived to Budapest, it was not that kind of stereotypical uh, single, uh, darker-skinned, angry men, but it, it was families with children. And there was a, a survey about the level of xenophobia of Hungarian population that was high before the arrival of refugees. It actually went down with the arrival of refugees. So at the time when people started to see real people, like mothers with babies, then the level of xenophobia went down. And then they left the country, most of them went to Western Europe, and then the government propaganda continued, so the level of xenophobia went up again. Now what happened in Ukraine, the whole thing was so quick that the people arrived first, and not the political response. So what happened was people actually seeing real people, and this sense of solidarity started to, to, to bloom in, in, in terms of days. And when the government had something to say, it was already people, volunteers helping people on train stations. So the solidarity started uh, because the people were actually there before the political response. I hope it was an answer to the question, even though the situation is much more complex than that. Okay, thank you so much for uh, the panelists. Thank you so much for the audience. We have reached the end of a long panel a long day and we have another fruitful day hopefully tomorrow as well so with this I would like to thank you for your attention and do we have a formal closing of this day yes we we can close it uh, okay. now just um, a couple of uh, reminders um, tomorrow the, res the registration will be from 9 to half past 9 and we will start at half past 9 um, the second days and I would like also to thank uh, to the visibility department from Chesia that let us be here today also online and in live stream. So thank you very much. Thank you.